Hello, questioners and quest givers. My name is DB Skyn, and um, I try to do a monthly Q and A podcast for the people who um, support me financially in in in, a, in any way, shape, or form. It's been it's been a few months. <laughs> it's been uh, it's been a little while since I since I was last able to since I last had the wherewithal um, to to record one of these. So, quite a few questions build up. Which means it's probably going to be a long one this time, but hey, we'll 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 get through it together. Uh, is that from is that from September that question twelve oh nine twenty two or is that from December? I can never remember how American date formats work. Um, if I'm a little nasally, excuse me. I I have some some sinuses that that insist on 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 being quite swollen all the time for reasons passing understanding, uh, which has made it hard to record voiceover videos and stuff, which is very annoying. Anyway, um, Matrox DX. Hey, Sky, and so since Supergiant blessed us with the announcement of Hades 2, that's, like, that's how you can tell how long ago this was. I have a couple of questions. First thoughts on Melinos and Hecate designs from the little trailer. Not, not really, they, they, look, they look like Hades designs, um, which is to say that they look, like, really pretty and very gorgeous and very complete in themselves. Like, I don't know that I have a detailed review of any of what we've seen in the Hades trailer. Like, I l sort of like the idea of Hec Hecate, or Hecate, or however you want to pronounce it. I sort of like the idea of her as being like, no, no, yeah, she has the big witch hat, and she's like, she's like the, the witch who does the stuff with the cauldron and stuff, but also, she's fucking shredded and has like a 12 pack. <laughs> I kind of like that idea that she's both like a wizard and also fucking shredded in a gym bro but like one of my criticisms of Hades character design that I've that I've uh, formulated before is that those designs tend to default to hotness when other options are available right like uh, so like I'm which I don't mind because I find all of the characters in Hades extremely hot it all panders to me specifically but um it does there are times when I feel like it, they miss out on options that would be available if they weren't just defaulting to the standard beauty body ideal kind of thing. Um, did you ever finish playing all the way through Hades Epilogue? No, I keep meaning to. Um, I, I've, I I started in on it a little bit again after the Hades 2 announcement because I really I really do want to play through that epilogue. And then a bunch of other shit got in the way, like, like a bout with depression, uh, among other things. So, you know, uh, fell a little bit by the wayside. Um... But I do want to go back and finish it. Like, I just can't promise that it'll be on any kind of consistent schedule. And I also forgot to ask, have you ever checked out Dota 2 character design? No, not really. I, I tried playing Dota 2 for a little bit back when, when I was more into League, because I figured, like, hey, I should also see how the other part lives. Um, and I just... I just don't connect with Dota 2. I don't connect with its aesthetic, its art style, the way that the game is played. Like, my, my hot take would be that I think the character designs are, broadly speaking, kind of bad and forgettable, but also, I haven't really engaged deeply with it, so I don't think I don't think my hot take is really worth much. If I engaged more deeply with it, maybe I'd find something to like, but from the outside, gazing at the surface, I just I just can't find anything to, to, to grab onto there. Kenji the Snick asks, Oh no, they're, they're from December, because that one was from the 9th, and that, this one's from the 10th. From December, it's not quite from September. <laughs> Which wouldn't be, would not be weird if you were asking questions about Hades 2 back in September. Um, just saw the question about fighting game content. Would you also consider doing some content about series like Guilty Gear? I feel like that would be a much bigger bag for you to pull from in terms of research and lore connections, and maybe some music references, as every character in Guilty Gear has them. P.S. Please, please, please finish Monster Hunter Iceborne someday, because the final bosses there have a world of amazing design. Ha <laughs> ha. I am in my head, like not actually sort of in any substantial way, but in my head, I am planning to look into fighting game content. Like, as I said before, I am looking at diversifying. Like, I'm going to try and push my channel away from the orbit of just being a League of Legends channel, which is going to be a long process. That's going to take a while. Um, but I am doing that. And one of the things I'm looking at is fighting game character design because it's something I've actually wanted to talk about for ages but I don't the trouble is I don't play fighting games <laughs> I, I just don't like I've just never been able to really get into them I don't I don't necessarily find that hyper competitive one versus one thing compelling like if I play a fighting game I'm more of a smash guy like because I want to like do stupid shit and, and like mess with my friends um 
the sort of the sort of like the thrill of of competitive fighting games are a little bit lost on me, I think. But then also, like again, it's the thing of like I haven't engaged very deeply with them. Like the last fighting game that I engaged deeply with was like Marvel vs. Capcom on the PlayStation, and that was on a PlayStation controller, right? Which is not necessarily the greatest way to play a fighting game. PS One controller of all things. Um, so, like, I have this half-baked plan in my head that when Riot eventually release their Project L um, and, like, their own fighting game, that'll be a great transition point where I can, like, I can make content about that and that'll maybe draw in a bit of a fighting game crowd to the channel and then I can sort of use that as a transition point to maybe go into talking about Guilty Gear, maybe go into talking about um, Street Fighter, frankly, because like, Street Fighter VI looks kind of amazing. Um from the outside. I definitely do want to talk about Arxis games, though. Like, specifically their... Like, Dan Floyd has a fantastic video on Arxis and their animation process and the way that they put together this 3D, 2D anime look that they've that they've become so famous for. I think there's definitely some video in, in going back and looking at that. It's just a matter of time. And right now, my priority isn't on any of that. Right now, this moment, I actually I took a break from doing this in order to make this video. Um... Right now, my priority is I like, want to finish the goddamn Many Meanings of Bloodborne video. It's been my albatross. It's been sitting on my neck for a year, basically, at this point. And I want... I am I am in sight. Like, I can see the end of it. I am... I am putting the video together now, finally. And I have, like, 99% of the assets that I need. And as soon as the last one comes in, I, I can... I can finally finish it, and that's going to be such a fucking relief for me. So that's all I'm focusing on right now. And after that, I want to get back to Elden Ring. So... Fighting game content is a maybe, but it's not going to be any time in the nearest future. Also, as for Monster Hunter Iceborne, I think I am done with that game. Uh, Rise kind of replaced it as the game I'm playing. And now I've got Wild Hearts, which once that's got a few performance patches. Oh boy, I, I've, I actually really like what, what I've experienced with the combat in that game. Let's see. Oh, here's a long one. Uh, while there were a lot of random things that happened at the Game Awards, Maddie McMuscles posted a tweet that got me thinking back to a certain video about the body shape of female athletes, right? To summarize the tweet, Muscle Mama Supremacy is here with pictures, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's a little bit long for the setup. From this lineup of ladies, would you say that there might be some hope for a future of diversity in character design, or will the supremacy end as quickly as it started? <sighs> it's kind of hard to say. I think you are right that, like broader culture is starting to have more of a general appreciation for women who are shredded like i think i think there's a little bit of an aesthetic swing towards that as like an a goal for appeal like this is something that companies have realized like oh okay like I th and i think lady dimitresh um from from resident evil village was like one of the one of the trigger points for that but like where like powerful dommy mommies can be a viable way to pander which has allowed the character designers who work on these games to like point to stuff like Lady Dimitrescu and say hey that worked here and like this thing worked in Hades like they've been able to point to these examples to argue for why it is commercially viable to do this I wouldn't expect it to be like I would expect that this means that we'll more consistently see shredded female characters, which will be nice. Like, I certainly appreciate that. I wouldn't expect that to mean that we'll see any kind of, like, really broader range of diversity in body types. Because what's going to happen is capital is going to go, okay, this one, this one expression of this is the one that's profitable. And then they're just going to, they're just going to do that. Like, like, um... Like, because what we've got so far with with all these muscle mommies is like, yeah, but you also notice how they have hourglass waists, all of them, right? You, you notice how, like, they all have hourglass waists. None of them are bodybuilder shredded. Or rather, they're all bodybuilder shredded. None of them are powerlifter shredded, right? Like, which is a very different expression of the body type. They still exhibit a lot of, like, the traditional feminine traits, and a bunch of them are also very highly sexualized in a very traditional way. So it's like, yeah, this is it's nice that this thing has... It's nice that this thing has like started to sort of enter as as like a viable archetype in in like AAA mainstream game design. I wouldn't expect it to herald any kind of rising tide of greater actual body diversity in gaming. It's it's like a sm it's like a small step. I wouldn't say that it's the the presaging of any kind of avalanche, unfortunately. Let's see. Uh Oh lord, this is a long question. Hang on. So, let me just read through this. The sibling relationship, blah, blah, blah. I guess someone is familiar with more other cultures than just honey with social media. 
One of the most prominent themes in the Western fictional universe is the relationship with the parents. Yeah, I, I, I'd say... I'd say you're right in a very narrow band of Western fictional universes. Like, the MCU, as you, as you say, like Star Wars, like pop culture things, like um, Disney movies often deal with that shit. But that's because a lot of that media is geared towards children and parents with kids, like the parents who need to take the children to see the movies, right? That's kind of why they do that. Um, so... Like it's, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's like one of the most prominent themes in the Western fictional universe. No, uh, I if you look outside of of sort of the broad pop cultural sphere, you'll find much more varied series of themes. Um, but I, trying to cut to the heart of the question, which is kind of complicated. I yeah, like so what you're asking is that League of Legends has more sibling dynamics than parent dynamics. Um, do you think they have the potential to explore something new, or are they dealing with the same Western tropes as other universes do? Well, again, this is where I'll say they're not doing anything new. They're just coming at it from a from a different angle, right? Like, um, I'd say that like the sibling dynamics in, for example, Arcane, take after um, like they, they sort of operate in the same space as Avatar, for example. Avatar: The Last Airbender dealt a lot with sibling relationships, also parent relationships, but like there's a lot of of explorations of sibling relationships in there, as there indeed are in a lot of other spheres of pop culture, media geared towards kids. Um, like young adult novels, for example, are fucking full of sibling relationships. Um, so I don't know that this, I, I don't think the League of Legends universe is exploring anything particularly new there. Um, they're just exploring a different sphere of, of like tropes that are readily available in pop culture. Um, and like, do you know of other types of relationships those other cultures explore more of? Like, no. Like, family relationships of various kinds are universal. Like, you'll find those in every culture everywhere across the earth. Like, um, like whatever the relationship, like, like, um, like, historically, Chinese, Chinese media, for example, explores a lot the, like, the filial piety, like, the relationships, especially to the patriarch, to the father figure, um, not just as a personal emotional relationship, but, like, as, as a, as a relationship between the person and the state as well, like, in, in having filial piety to your parent, you also having filial piety towards the emperor or towards the state or towards the, the order of the world, um, uh, like, that, so that exists everywhere. I, I don't know that I could give you any specific recommendations, sort of on the basis that you're asking, um, except to say, you you gave me a, va a kind of complicated, vague question. So I'm giving you a kind of complicated, vague answer, which is that outside of the very narrow bonds and 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 spaces of Western pop culture, like the the pop culture that America exports to the world, you will find that literature and art explores as wide and varied a set of relationships as 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 there exists in the human condition. Colada, do you ever wear makeup? If you do, what styles do you enjoy? Uh, I don't, and it's mostly, it's not so much because I'm, I'm like, I wouldn't want to, it's mostly I can't be fucking bothered. Um, I'm a YouTuber. I spend the vast majority of my time on my ass in front of my computer. When I go out, it's mostly to do grocery shopping or like go to like, um, like go to the gym to like take a spin class every once in a while. Like. I don't have a lot of socialization with people, and as such, I don't have much reason to. Like, I've sort of been trying to up my fashion game a little bit recently. Like, I've been sort of trying. I own a lot of, like, hoodies and t-shirts and, uh, like, sweatpants and, and jeans, right? Like, which is, like, basic gamer uniform, I know. But also, you know, maybe it's... I, I felt like it's time to sort of start expanding my, my wardrobe a little bit. And, hell, maybe I should try some makeup as well at some point. But, uh, I don't know. It seems like a bunch of work to learn how to do that, and I kind of can't be arsed. <laughs> Let's see, Arno, the Blind Starkist. What is your opinion on humanoid furry Pokemon? That's a very broad question. I don't really know what you're asking. Like, I, I don't think I have a general opinion on humanoid fur uh, furry Pokemon. Like, they exist. They're all, like, go if you delve into fan art spaces, they are all humanoid. Like, they've all been made humanoid by someone somewhere for various purposes of various degrees of wholesomeness. Um, but, like, are you asking whether I think it's good when Pokemon are humanoid? It's like, that's not something I have a singular opinion on. I think Lucario, which is a very humanoid Pokemon, is cool. I think Jinx is a fucking horror and also a racist caricature that probably shouldn't be in the games anymore. Um, 
Like, I think Mr. Mime kind of doesn't work. I, neither does Mr. Rhyme. Like, Mr. Mime and its forms are too human. Like, it, I don't see them as creatures. I just see them as, like, little people who you're imprisoning in, in Pokeballs. Like, it sort of breaks the illusion that you're gathering creatures. Like, whether those are spirit creatures or animal creatures. Like, it sort of breaks that illusion. But others of them are fine. Like, like Blaziken is fine, for example. Like, uh, Lopunny is fine. Um... Like, they're, they they are all very heavily sexualized, but that's just the nature of, you know, fan art. So, I don't have a strong overall opinion on it, I don't think. Hi, do you own or do you used to own any pets? If so, can we see them? I have rats. Um, those are the pets. I, I used to have a cat when I was, uh, when I was a kid. I want to have cats again. We are allowed to have cats in the apartment that I live in now, finally. Uh, so we're looking at adopting a pair of cats. I can't really show you any of my pets right here, right now. I don't really have the means to pull anything into the thing here. Um, but yeah. Also, will you ever try a Pokemon fan game called Pokemon Rejuvenation? No, not really. Like, I I don't have a lot of interest in Pokemon fan games. Because I think they all kind of... Like, well, all of the ones I've tried. And I've tried a bunch. Like, Pokemon Uranium. I've tried, like, a bunch of... Like, uh, uh, the, like a bunch of Fire Red hacks that sort of like, um, uh, well, not Fire Red hacks, but, but a bunch of ROM hacks that sort of try to create new Pokemon games within the confines of the existing, and I just I I, I can't be, because like, Pokemon fan games generally want something very different out of Pokemon games than I do, right? They, they just aren't about the things that I find interesting about Pokemon, and the character design that they do for Poke, original Pokemon a lot of the time is... I mean, I don't want to be ungenerous, but I don't think... I, I don't like it. Let's say I don't like it. Let's say that. Let's leave it at that, because, like, it is fan works, and they're not... They shouldn't be held to the same standard as the Pokemon company, but... No, I, I, I just... I have just never been able to connect with a Pokemon fan game. I just don't find them very good. RC Scooter, what are some holiday films that just bring out the best of the season for you? Uh, not really. I don't... I don't know that I... We don't... I, I don't think we have that much of a holiday film culture in Denmark. Like, we don't have stuff like a Christmas story running permanently on one channel. We don't have the same movies that get broadcast every year in the same way. Like, Home Alone, I think, used to run almost annually. I don't know that it does anymore. It's also, I just don't engage with Christmas media very much. Um, or Halloween media. Like, I guess Nightmare Before Christmas. Like, that's a holiday film, technically. Um... That, that to me, like, is... But that's not, again, we don't really have Halloween over here. That's not really a tradition we have. We have Festalaun, which is in, in, in the spring. Um, so it's like, not 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 really. I, I don't really think I have anything to answer you on that one with. Let's see. What are some of the earliest media you can remember being influential or important to you in some way? Uh, Donald Duck comics. Comics. Um, Disney comics. Also, also stuff like Tintin, Asterix, uh, Gammelpot. What the hell is he called in English? Dabert, Dau Dabert, Dau Dabert. I don't know. It's a it's a Dutch comic about a little old man with a magic pouch who travels around and has like fantasy adventures. I remember loving that a lot. Uh, the comics of Francois, who's a Belgian, I believe, comic artist who created um, Gaston Lagaffe, and uh, was he also responsible for Spirou, or was that another guy? Um, yeah, Peyo, who created the Smurfs. Like, a lot of the Belgian-French uh, comic artists are influential to me. And then the Italian comic scene, um, which was which has been very productive in creating Disney comics, especially. Like, there's a lot of Italian artists, and also Danish artists, actually, who do Disney comics, officially licensed Disney comics um, that are sort of published in, in like, monthly collections called Jumbo Books or Jumbo Books that I read a ton of as a kid. I remember especially... Mickey Mouse um, had his own series of detective books where, like, it's comics where Mickey Mouse is a noir detective, right? So he has, like, he has his own rogue ga rogues gallery of, like, super villains that he f that he foils, like the uh, the Blot. Um, of course, Pete um, is, is often a villain in his stories. A bunch of original villains um, as well show up. And those are sort of my earliest exposure to like sort of like detective stories and like crime thrillers just you know obviously in a format that that suited for children where he solves crimes like oh no someone robbed the museum but interestingly like they are allowed to take they were allowed to take characters like mickey and donald and and like uh, uncle scrooge for that matter in much darker and more mature directions than i think you'd expect um from disney comics like of all things right um 
I remember one story in particular where Mickey, like he's he's a private eye detective um, in, in this version of the story. He has like a cordial relationship with the police chief. And he solves this, this crime of like a cat burglar who's been like stealing like valuable artwork. Um, but it turns out the cat burglar is actually doing it because like a criminal is threatening the life of his daughter. Right, and so like the cat burglar is only doing it for that, and the cat burglar has his own scheme going about like where he's he's trying to set the villain who has his daughter captured up to up to up to fall, and get away with like a valuable diamond, um, so, so that he can use to sort of buy his own freedom and and like like secure a nice future for his daughter, and it actually ends with Mickey like deciding to let him go because like yeah you know like he stole that diamond but he stole it from a bunch of rich assholes so who cares like I remember those being quite influential to me because like they they. Like, especially those Italian comics are actually allowed to give these Disney... Like, someone like Mickey, who is such a non-character in every other kind of media that he appears in, they're allowed to give him some character. The same thing goes with Donald. Like, there's a lot of Donald Duck comics comics in... God, I'm so fucking nasally right now. In Europe, in European publishing, that allow Donald, like, a lot of actual character, a lot of actual pathos. Um, if you ever get a chance to look, uh, to read The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck by Don Rosa... Do it, like, because you're you're not ready for the vision of the Donald Duck family that that those comics present. Kenji the Snack again. What do you think makes Monster Hunter both uh, both the monsters and the environment go a step up in terms of looking fantastical yet grounded in its aesthetic? I disagree. I don't think it looks grounded at all. Monster Hunter. Um, I think that's what's good about it is that it's. I need to blow my nose. <laughs> is that it's not grounded, like, at all. I think I think what you're talking about is that they spend a lot of time making the physicality of these monsters believable, right? Like, that they have a believable weight and anatomy to them that sort of makes sense intuitively, even if it doesn't make any sense scientifically. And I think you're right about that, but I don't think there's really anything grounded about them. They are, they are fantastical, primarily. They're fantastical and they're stylized. And... I really do want to point to the animation in Monster Hunter being the thing that makes the monsters what they are. Like, it's the animation. The designs are good, but it's the fact that these things move with such a carefully calibrated set of animation, which is a carefully calibrated set of, of communication in their animation that makes them special. Like, that makes them fantastic. Um... Like, that, I think that is Monster Hunter's biggest strength. Aesthetically, Monster Hunter is pretty generic. Like, aesthetically, it's it's not really that interesting. It's like, Rathalos is just a fantasy drake. Like, it's just like a fantasy vi vivern. Like, that's... It's very bog state. There's nothing special about Rathalos, right? Like, they're really... And most of the monsters I've seen Monster Hunter, like, they're cool, but they're not like, whoa, I've never seen anything like this before. For the most part, no, they're not. They're like they're very obviously based on like real animals or mythological creatures they're not i don't think i've ever really had one that sort of blew my mind and went whoa right i don't think that's where the strength is i think the strength is in the way they move like that creates the physical relationship with the player um so i think i think that's where where it gets its pop from also when you do shorts on metal gear rising i haven't played it so no um, maybe I will play it. I do want to, but it's one of those things of, like, I have so many other fucking things I need to do, and it's not really on the top of my priority list. Variasis. Do you have any mecha setting or franchise you enjoy? Yes. Ring of Red. It's a PS2 game. I think it also came out on 360, uh, from well back in the day, that is set in an alternate history where instead of the nukes being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki... You, the United States invaded, um, and the Russian, like, the USSR invaded from the north, and Japan ended up in a situation like Vietnam and Korea, where they were split down the middle along, like, a communist north and a western-aligned south. And it's diesel punk. It's set in the 60s, in the height, during the heights of the Cold War. So all the mecha are, the, like, these huge, clunky, chunky, diesel-powered motherfuckers, like, like, really deeply in the aesthetic of, like, like, war machines and material from like the 60s and 70s like big chunky huge sheets of metal they make all kinds of noise they have like the sound design is fantastic in that game where like you can hear like the diesel engine going like like doing that chugging noise that diesel engines have it's smoky it's greasy it's oily it's ugly like it i really love them i really really like that particular mecha setting 
It's so fucking cool. I recommend that to anyone. Outside of that, I don't really have a... Like, I liked Tank and Top and Gurren Lagann. Um, I have enjoyed the occasional Gundam series, but outside of that, I don't have a lot of affinity for Mecha. Matrox, wanted to thank you for the God of War series. Loved seeing the whole series. Now for the question. From whatever knowledge you have about D&D monsters, is there a specific one you like the most? Oh, a favorite questions. I'm sorry. I cannot answer you favorites questions. I just can't. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know how to do it because things are good for different reasons and I don't know how to stack rank them against uh, each other in that way. There are plenty of D&D &D monsters I like. Like, I like owl bears. They're cool. Um, I like displacer beasts. Displacer beasts are really fucking cool. I like the idea of them having, like, a, a mirror image that sort of appears where they aren't. That sort of like, creates this confusing visual illusion. That's pretty cool. Um... I've always had a fondness for Beholders just because of the way that they're written is so fucking stupid and goofy. <laughs> um, like, they're terrifying, super powerful magical monsters, but they're also just these vain, self-obsessed, narcissistic dickheads, um, which I really quite enjoy. Uh, demi are pretty cool. Like, I, I like them as an idea, even if their character designs are sort of a little bit all over the place. Um, Cobalts. Like, a lot of good cobalt designs show up. Like, I like furry cobalts, fuzzy little cobalts. They're cool. Um, but yeah, no, favorites, I, I can't give you any favorites. Your thoughts on cosmic horror in general? No. Um, again, like, I'm sorry, that's that's a very broad question. I don't have any thoughts on cosmic horror in general. Um, I, I will have thoughts on any given piece of cosmic horror media. But in general, it's just, like, it's a genre. So Sometimes it is good. Uh, sometimes it is bad, and it depends on the execution, which is like, it's just like a shitty answer, right? Like, that's not really interesting, um, but that's that's kind of all, like, it's the same thing, like, your thoughts on westerns, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Uh, thoughts on sci-fi, sometimes it's good, sometimes, let's, I'm sorry, um, it, it is not within my capacity to give a good answer to a question like that, I'm afraid. Um, do you have any particular feelings towards a story that tries to explore incomprehensible topics? Again too broad like that that can be good or bad um but i don't have any general opinion on it at all like i i wouldn't know how to frame an answer about that uh without making necessarily going in and, and choosing something that's much more specific than what's being asked do you have any horror media that you'd like to recommend uh fuck what's it called um um let me just let me just google real quick gyo Right, Gyo, um, by Junji Ito. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it means fish, literally. It's one of the scariest fucking things I've ever read in my life. Like, the imagery and just, just the way that this thing is put together scared the absolute piss out of me when I read it for the first time. But Gyo by Junji Ito. Read that. Um, cause, oh shit. Oh, it's because I have hotkeys set to the, to the letters. So it accidentally reset the thing. I needed to press W, um, which resets it. But yeah, no, um, Gyobai by Junji Ito. It's basically, it's just, it's kind of a shit post of a horror series. It's just basically just about what if, what if sharks could go on land and attack people and fish and stuff. Um, and he sort of builds a whole absolutely fucking horrifying uh, visual universe around that really stupid idea, and it is genuinely fucking terrifying. Well, I, I mean, I read it when I was somewhat younger, but, you know, um, but that generally fucking terrified me. I think people should read it, just because it sort of proves that you don't need a high, high like, a sort of high concept, like, sort of anything intellectual or smart to build horror around. Sometimes you can just have a really fucked up idea and then render it in the most fucked up way possible, and that'll work. Have you seen some scenes from Sonic Prime? If so, what do you think of animation? I was unimpressed with it. Like, it, I don't think it's bad. Like, I think it's fine. It is perfectly decent for a animated series that's geared towards kids. Like, but outside of that, I don't... I don't... I, I wasn't impressed with it. It wasn't really, like, something I went, Oh, shit, I want to watch this for the animation. Um, like, they did do those animations that were, like, directed by Tyson Hesse. Um, and, like, in the style of the Sonic Mania... Thing. I thought that was interesting in terms of the animation, just because it used so many of cool 2D animation principles, but Sonic Prime is just another kids series on Netflix. Like, it's it's really nothing special to me. 
What were you most grateful for in 2022? Asks Kara. And do you have anything you want to accomplish in 2023? I mean... It... What was I most grateful for? It's I, I don't know that I can give a, a answer to that question that isn't kind of cringy and YouTubery because it's 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 you guys. Um, it's the fact that 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 I get to do this dumb nonsense for a living somehow. Like I've I've lucked my way into this that I get as much support as I do on Patreon and like people show up for my videos and they're interested in 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 the stuff I make. That's the thing I'm most grateful for always. Because that's a privilege, and that's luck. Like, there's a lot of luck that goes into that. And I I, I am endlessly grateful for it. I, I really genuinely am. Do you have any things you want to accomplish in 2023? I want, yeah, like I said, I want to I wanna get the Bloodborne series out. I want to get the Elden Ring series rolling again. Like, those are the two goals I have set in stone. That This is the shit that must happen. Like, I must... Just, God damn it. They are... They have been rocks around my neck, and they've been frustrating the hell out of me that I haven't been able to move on them. Um, and then the other goal is to transition away from being reliant on League of Legends content. I'll still make it, like, because I still love that fucking universe, and I love those those characters, and, like, when the Riot Forge games come out, like, I'm gonna be all over them, you better fucking believe me. But I also want to move away from them. I want to get away from being so reliant on them for numbers, right? Like, I, I'm reliant on them for numbers in terms of, of uh, view counts, in terms of advertising revenue, um, in terms of relevance, and I want to get away from that. I want to move away so that I, I can make videos about League of Legends, but I don't depend on it. Uh, that That's the secondary goal in 2023. Shura, I'm a slightly newer viewer, and I keep getting recommended videos from you and Necrit from years ago about League lore and the general state and quality of the lore. I know you still have criticisms of it, but I was wondering how your opinions may have changed over the years about the general state or quality of League lore. Has it gotten better? Have your predictions about it come true? Pleasant surprises? Have you become more optimistic about it or pessimistic? That's a little all over the place. Um, I'd say generally the quality of what gets put out has increased over time. I remember a period like back when I started making videos. Like one of the reasons I started, like one of one of my early, the early videos I put out on my channel were videos that were very, very critical of Riot's lore output because they wrote some stories and published them that were truly just like shoddy, like really shoddy, like really felt like someone's first draft that just hadn't gone past an editor at all, um, and really badly put together and not very well considered at all. Um, and so I'd say in general, the, the quality of that which gets published has consistently increased and gotten better. Like, consistently, I think Riot has gotten better at the stories that they do tell. Downside is that they've also gotten, like, I think Arcane kind of blew the company up in a, li a little bit internally, like in terms of how they handle story and lore. I, I, I believe that now the arcane team like the 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 i think internally they're called the entertainment division are in charge of league of legends lore because of the success of arcane that sort of allowed them to stage like a takeover of of the company internally like in terms of where the story goes and that's why riot recently came out with this thing of like oh we'll be streamlining all the lore and like bringing it all together in the future which is something i have mixed feelings about um and that's why over the past year they've sort of just basically been completely fucking silent and haven't published any goddamn thing. It's because there's this big internal shuffle about where they're trying to reorganize their entire approach to storytelling in the League of Legends universe around the success of Arcane, which I think is a very bad idea. Um, so, like, yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic about, like, I'm optimistic about Arcane Season 2. I'm optimistic about the Riot Forge games. I hope they let Anthony Reynolds write more novels, because that was very cool um, when 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 he did that. Um, but, like, am I optimistic about it? Not really. It kind of seems like someone internally at Riot has got to be in their bonnet about, we're going to unify our whole narrative universe yeah, like across all of our products, and that's not going to work. That is, that is going to fall on his face and fail. And the reason why I say that is because I've seen that before, Many, many times at Marvel, at DC, at, like, Warhammer has tried it. Like, every ongoing concern of major IPs has tried doing this, and it always fucking fails. Every time. 
It's not gonna work. It can't work. You have to allow things to be different across different products to a certain extent. You can't unify this shit coherently across an entire product. You can't do it and you shouldn't do it because if you had, if you if you had prioritized doing that in the past, you would never have made Arcane. So, like, I, I'm pessimistic about that, but I'm optimistic about specific things, right? So, yeah, I, I think that answers your question. Maybe? <laughs> not sure. Let's see. Salaman, since I have nothing to watch, what childhood cartoons would you recommend us? The Moomins? Yeah. The Moomins. Um, the 1980s Moomins, specifically, which was like a Finnish Japanese co-production. That one, I would recommend you. Uh, that one's good, I know. Uh, if you wanted, like, kid, kids cartoons. Outside of that, not a lot, because, like, kids cartoons have gotten way better. Like, then when I was like, when I was a kid, they were shit compared to what they are now. I, I'm telling you, like, outside of like, certified bangers and classics like Avatar The Last Airbender, not really. Like, <laughs> thinking back on them, most of them were crap compared to the options that you have today. Uh, so yeah, like the Moomin cartoon, I think is the one that would that would come off my head as, as a recommendation. What are your favorite versus least favorite household chores? Again, favorites, uh, I can't pick favorites, but I do find that I have an easier time doing the dishes than almost anything else. For whatever reason, like that, for whatever reason, that's kind of meditative to me, to do the dishes and like finish them up, like put them on the thing to dry them, let them dry for a while. Um, usually because I do it while I'm cooking anyway. Like if, if I'm cooking some food, I'll be doing the dishes at the same time. Um, and it sort of becomes a, like, oh, I need to wait for this thing to simmer. Okay, I'll just do a couple of dishes kind of. And like as I am finishing up cutting things on the cutting board and stuff, I'll put it away, like wash it quickly and the things. It. So I guess that's my favorite. It's not like I, like I enjoy it. It's just it's the easiest one for me to do. And the one that's probably hardest is laundry just because I forget. Um, and you have to hang it up to dry. And like we don't have a dryer. Um, you have to hang it up to dry and like, fold it, put it back in the goddamn thing. I was like, ah. T troublesome. I just, I, why can't we just keep all of our clothes in the big pile on the floor? Uh, that's easier. <laughs> Koalata, if your life had a soundtrack, which artists would compose the music? Uh, mm. I don't know. Like, I know who I'd want. To, I'd want to have, like, Joe he Hijaishi, you know. I'd want him. I'd want John Williams. Um... Realistically, though? Realistically, most of my life doesn't have a soundtrack. I don't think. It's more like, we have a Breath of the Wild background right here. More like that, I think, than any kind of, of composed soundtrack, really. Lurper Lurpa, you have joined me in my heroic quest to vanquish the Dark Lord and revive the world tree. What is your character class archetype? Oh, um, I'm the coward who runs away. Immediately, like just immediately runs away um, and hides f for the whole time. Like just never, never shows up again. Doesn't show up in the 11th hour to save the part. Just runs away and stays away. And that's that realistically speaking. Um, if it's a thing of like, no, no, you must be part of the party kind of thing. It's fine. I'll be a f your fucking cleric because um, then everyone has to protect me. <laughs> Can't let the healer die. I'm the fucking white mage. Uh, so... No one fucks with me, um, and you all must sacrifice yourselves to protect me because I'm the one who can re revive you. Uh, that that would be that would be me, like the healer, specifically because that puts me in the position of having lots of people standing in front of me. <laughs> Mirrors, as someone who enjoys your rants about Ulda, has more directly political content ever been something you considered? Yes and no. Like, as, as you can tell from my Final Fantasy XIV playthroughs and my just the general way that I am, I cannot fucking shut up about it. Um, like, it's a very relevant part of the way that I think, and it's part of the way that I criticize media. But also, I don't fucking want that drama. No fucking way. Absolutely not. Uh, like, I, I have sit, I sat outside here and, like, I've seen the communities that surround directly political streamers, like debate streamers, and, like, these characters and I've seen the drama that surrounds like left like bread tube left tube like all of those spaces that sort of organize themselves specifically and explicitly around political content and I don't want any part of that absolutely fucking not no I like I refuse to be made to navigate that shit I it's toxic it's awful 
Um, I, I don't know. Like, and I don't say that in, in, in a way of like denigrating the people who are creators in that space. I'm saying the community around that, like the, the, the constant warfare with right wing chuds and like the constant creator, like creators making content about other creators and calling each other out and shit. I don't want any part of that. It, it like I think I would become suicidally depressed if that was how I made my money. So no, I don't want to. Like, I I don't want to. Lepre Lepre. How do you pronounce? Oh, squirrel. Oh yeah, squirrel. I pronounce it the the normal way, which is squirrel, <laughs> squirrel, or squirrel, if you're British about it. Echo, Lesbian Disaster. Uh, hey, Skyn, just started rewatching the League of Legends Champion Design Hot Takes compilation in your TV shorts. And your comments about Shaco being the embodiment of the murder clown trope with his design being not terribly unique got me wondering. If you were to redesign Shaco, how would you go about doing it? Possibly while using his lack of lore to keep him sort of mysterious. That's the thing is, like, Shaco sucks, and there's nothing interesting about him at all. Um... So I would throw him out. Like, like if, if I was given complete creative control of the character, I'd just delete him. Just get rid of him. He's not important. He doesn't matter. Like, there's no reason to keep him because he doesn't he doesn't contribute anything. He's not he's not useful or valuable in any way for the for the aesthetics and the design of, of League of Legends as a video game. If I had to like, no, you have to keep him, I'd be like, okay, fuck it. We'll we'll do the thing that we did that they didn't do with Gwen. And just, like, he has, like, a placeholder piece of lore which sort of says, ah, he was the doll of a mysterious haunted prince that came to life and killed people. I'd go with that, like, make him a haunted doll and, like, make him a really fucking creepy one. Like, a really... And not a jester one, not a clown doll, but, like, a doll that kills people. That's, that's what I would do. Like, maybe a Russian doll actually would be an interesting way to do it and sort of keep his whole thing about clones and having multiple forms of himself. Uh, something like a Russian doll kind of thing that has keeps multiple copies of itself inside of itself. And I'd make it mechanical specifically. A mechanical doll. Like, with springs and, like, like that makes, like, a horrible creaking noise when it moves. Right? So, like, like when he raises his arm to stab someone, you get this sound. Like, that, that kind of thing. If, if I fucking had to. But I'd just delete him because there's no point keeping him. He doesn't do anything. He's not valuable or useful. And the only reason to keep him is because a bunch of Shaco mains would be upset. And I don't value Shaco mains. <laughs> I don't value them as people. Um, <laughs> why am I saying this? This is stupid. Uh, I don't mean that, obviously. But like, it's, it, it's sort of my pet peeve with League of Legends is the conservatism. Um... That's very inherent to Riot because they they are so unwilling to ever sacrifice the least bit of immediate player satisfaction for the long term health of the game, um, like, and that's something that scared them away from doing better reworks of champions. Like like Galio, absolutely eradicated, deleted old Galio from the game. That character was lost. He was gone. Same thing with Trundle. The old character is gone. He was lost. He was he was obliterated in the rework. And it was the right call. In both cases, it was the right call. It made a better character who fits the game better and who's just overall better designed. If they had been updated to be faithful to their old forms, they would be worse. Um, and it annoys me that Riot now has become so fucking unwilling to ever throw anything out for fear of, like, the old mains of the champion being upset about. Because, like, yeah, they're gonna be, but, like, you have... You can't just make decisions based on whatever the players happen to want, say that they want at the time. You have to make decisions based on what is healthy for the game. What is good for the game? What is necessary for the game? Uh, like, what creates a better artistic product? And that, for me, would include deleting a bunch of champions. Like, there's fucking over 150 of these motherfuckers right now. We can do without a few of them. Um, but Riot can't make those decisions because they are a capitalist company and, like, and also just the way that their fucking company philosophy, this stupid company philosophy, like players first, which means doesn't actually mean putting first what is best for the players. It means putting first whatever extracts the most value from the players is the truth of it, which pisses me off when I see executives sort of, oh, we believe in players first. Fuck you. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't believe in that. You don't believe in that for one fucking second. You believe in players first assuming that they're players who pay. 
assuming that they're players who are sucked into your ecosystems and engage very, very heavily and spend a lot of the hours, the finite hours of their life engaging with your product and who are addicted to the shit that you put out. That's what you mean when you say players first. You don't actually mean casuals. You don't actually mean like, like you don't actually mean like players first from a long-term perspective. You mean players first in the short term of whatever makes them happy right now, whatever extracts money from their wallets right now. Fuck you. Anyway, that was not at all the thing that, that, that you asked about. I just went off on a thing there. Azeli, do you know where the happiest Blahaya sold? I want to make sure I'm not picking mine up from a breeder or heard that you offer things to them. I think they still have them at Ikea. I'm sorry, I know you're doing like a bit here, but I, I, I don't really know how to engage with that bit. Uh, just buy one from Ikea, they're cute. RC Scooter, if you had to pick a piece of literature to get a Muppets adaptation, what would your pick be? And which characters being played with by which Muppets and which human actors would you want in it? I would want... Muppet Macbeth. And I would want the only human character. Just one. One human character. Oh, that's hard because it's funny if it's Macbeth. That's the big dramatic role, right? Yeah, I think it has to be Macbeth. Like, I was tempted to say Lady Macbeth just because she's the more melodramatic of the two, but, uh, like, Macbeth is the only human character and then the Muppets. And then no... Like, then no making it funny. Like, no... Like, blood and guts and all of the angst and the horror and the existential melancholy and, like, the... the the, the self-hatred that comes with it. Like, no softening that shit. But also, no taking out the comedy comedy bits. That's something that really pisses me off about modern adaptations of Macbeth. Like, um, Michael Fassbender was in one, like, a really pretentious Macbeth adaptation some years ago that was, like, broadly very good, but they removed all of the comedy, all of the comic relief. Every single, every single funny scene was just, like, excised, like, torn out of it. Same thing with the one that was by, uh, where it was, um... Denzel Washington playing Macbeth. Same thing. They took out all of the comedy bits, all of the dick jokes, uh, like like that entire extended monologue about whiskey dick. Just took it out. Fuck that. No, keep that in. Um, but no, yeah, Macbeth, but like only a human actor in in the role of Macbeth himself. And who would I want to play Macbeth? It needs to be an older actor. Pedro Pascal. Pedro Pascal could do an amazing fucking Macbeth op opposite the Muppets. Absolutely. Fuck yeah, do that. Lurper Lurper, should we use time travel to go back in time and convince Ancient Man to domesticate the otter? No. No, no, no. Otters deserve to roam free. They they don't deserve uh, what domestication by humans would do to them. Plus, they're predators. They're not really useful um, domesticated. So, no. Red Lemon, what piece of Nordic folklore do you think would make for the most interesting inspiration for a Pokemon concept? Nukin. Absolutely Nukin. Um, yeah. Yeah, Nukin, because, like, there's other... Like, you can go for Tala, Yeda, uh, Nisa. There's plenty of others, but Nukin. Absolutely. Nukin um, the 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 Bog Witch, I think, would be the translation of that. Mosekun... Uh, she she is like when whenever you walk out over the fields in the morning and you see like the mist sort of just lying gently across the grass and like the bogs, that's because the bog wife is boiling. Um, she she is she is she's brewing rather. She's brewing her her big cauldron, and the fog emerges out over the fields. And like if you go to the bog wife, um, she'll you can get potions and and elixirs and medicines from her, but you can also get transformed into terrible things and used and like cut up and eaten and shit. Uh, so she, she might be a, a good inspiration point, but Nukin, specifically, because it's it's a spirit that sits under waterfalls and plays music that draws people to drown themselves in the water. Um, which seems like a good inspiration for a ghost Pokemon, right? Maybe inappropriate to ask, but when was the last time you cried and what was the reason? Oh, uh, the last time I cried was because I read One Piece again, and I got to um, I got to the death of Ace, and if I just load up that particular chapter and read it, it doesn't hit me very hard. But every time I sort of decide to reread One Piece from the start, which I do like once a fucking year at this point, I, I'd never get all the way up to current. Like, I decide to reread One Piece from the start, I get to chapter like some hundreds, 
Uh, and then I kind of fall out of it. And then at some point I go, no, I want to reread from the start. And then I start all over again. But every time I get to the death of Ace, uh, it, it, it breaks me in half. And it was no different this time. Nibelung, do you have any opinion regarding Overwatch 2 now that a few months has passed since it's launched? Uh, it sucks. Like, not necessarily the game itself. Like, I haven't played it, so I can't say that. But it sucks that they made Overwatch 2. It sucks the way that Blizzard has handled Overwatch. It sucks the way that Blizzard has treated its fandom. It sucks the way that it's treated its characters. It sucks the way that Blizzard has treated its developers. It sucks the way that Blizzard just sat there jerking off with hundreds of millions of dollars of in, in esports money trying to prop up this bubble that was always going to burst, which anyone with half a fucking brain cell to spare could have seen coming a million miles away, and they invested everything into this stupid competitive esports scene that was never, ever, 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 ever going to be viable because the economics of esports just doesn't work like that, and squandered the entire potential of Overwatch on it, and now they rolled out Overwatch 2 as a band-aid on a flagging product, on a on like a, an IP that was taking on water and was like in its death throes, trying to drum up enough hype to keep the corpse of the thing shambling on. And that's Overwatch 2, and now the developers who are trying their very fucking best are saddled with sort of trying to weekend at Bernie's this corpse into some shape that is like moderately serviceable, and it sucks. It sucks. It sucks the way that Overwatch has been treated by Blizzard. Hate it. Like, again, no comment on the quality of the game itself. I haven't played it. It's just the whole thing about Overwatch as a franchise sucks ass. Just sucks shit out of a straw. Ugh. Seth the Seal. Uh, two related questions about your opinion on art forms and mediums. Do you think it's fair to compare two different works of art and different art mediums? And if yes, should the differences in those media forms affect the comparison? So a film versus a video game or music versus painting? Uh, fair? I don't know. Again, like this is sort of, again, one of those very broad open-ended questions where it's like, uh, give me a specific example, I guess. Um, then maybe I could give you an answer. But other than that, it's like, that really depends on the context of, like, which film and video game are you comparing? Which music and painting? What digital art versus physical? Like, which ones? Uh, because the, whether the comparison is fair or not depends on what and how you compare it, right? Because, um, like, it's not fair to say that, that like, a book has bad cinematography because it's a book like it doesn't there isn't cinematography in a book right so that's that's an unfair comparison but like the presentation of characters the writing of dialogue those are fair mesh metrics upon which to compare the two i guess right like like you could compare the pros between any two things so i don't i don't really i don't really have a good answer for you there and is there an art meaning you feel has more impact on you emotionally than others no again it's it depends so much on context. Like, sometimes music can play my soul like harp strings. And sometimes a movie uh, snaps me in half like a twig, like uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once did. And sometimes it's a comic book, like One Piece. Sometimes it, like, no. Um, there is no art medium that like, that is more potent than any others. Like, no matter what anyone's, like, like, there's a lot of digital ink that gets spilled jerking off about how video games are the most potent arm form, art form because of interactivity. Like, no, fuck that. That's not how it works. I Like, if the art is good, it affects you. That's the thing that matters. Let's see. Do you think, uh, this is Siren Song, do you think like, a company like HoYoWars and Riot could learn more from each other? Hoyo actually seems to care about its story and characters, and they find a way to make it profitable. Riot seems to understand fantasy doesn't need to be a sexy white girl or guy all the time, and does incredibly fresh stuff in this genre when they're allowed to. They also seem to care about not being predatory. Ah, uh, no. Um, like, I, I don't, like, I think you're conceptualizing the two a little bit like people, um, which they aren't. They're corporations. And they're only... Like, on a corporate level, like, individual employees in the companies have all kinds of complex motivations, but as a corporate entity, both Hoyo and Riot, Mihoyo at Riot, are driven by one thing and one thing only, and that's profit. They need to deliver growth to their shareholders year over year. Literally, by law, they're required to do this. Um, and that is the only purpose and function of the corporation as an entity, is to deliver more value to shareholders. That's the only thing it exists to do. They have simply found different ways to do that. Like, Hoyo, with its gacha mechanics, has, like, essentially, essentially has a license to print money for itself. Um, 
and that's why like Hoyoverse is like repeats the same body type, like maximally commercially viable body type over and over and over again in like different permutations of appealing costumes and appealing archetypes because the function of characters within the Hoyoverse business model is to generate gacha pulls. Like is to is to make sure that whales will sink thirty thousand dollars a year into this fucking game so they can get the five or six star pulls of their favorite blorbos um that look sexy in just the way that appeals to them like that's why their design is so maximally commercially viable at all times um is because that is their business model riot on the other hand like they have a like they operate within a space where it's necessary for them to at least make gestures like it, it is for their profit margin for their profitability it is necessary for them to make gestures towards diversity right like that's from the company's perspective virtue signaling is necessary and again artists writers actual creative people who work in there are deeply passionate about making things more interesting and diverse absolutely from the corporation's perspective the only reason to do it is because it increases their market value in some way like it generates some kind of value maybe not directly in terms of sales but some value in terms of pr some value in terms of headlines some value in terms of you know and that those are the terms in which artists internally at riot pitch these things is like hey this is commercially viable this will give us good press this will like fill uh space in the roster that we haven't fully exploited in terms of delivering a power fantasy to the players that can encourage people to buy this thing and play it like those are the terms in which these two things get pitched internally at Riot 2, right? Um, so uh, they're not people. Um, they can't learn anything from each other in that way. That's not going to happen. Um, like, Hoyo seemed to care about his story and his characters. Yeah, but again, that's because, like, if you're not invested in the characters in Genshin Impact, if you're not invested in the narrative that they're going through, then you're not going to do a million gacha polls to get the newest, super cool, interesting character that gets introduced with the new space or the regional expansion or the patch update or whatever right it's from a corporate perspective that's what it's all about and they have nothing to learn from each other in that sense because they just have different business models um yeah like so long as you're asking about the corporations right the artists at riot yeah sure like there's probably some some something they could learn from each other if they were allowed to collaborate in a creative space but but that's not what it's about for the corporations, for the companies. Do you have any indie game recommendations for someone absolutely addicted to Pokemon? Not, not really. Like, if you're looking for something similar to Pokemon? No, not especially. There was that, um, what's it called? There was a competitor Pokemon. Or like a Pokemon-like that's like an MMO and it has like integrated Nuzlocke challenge things. Temtem is what it's called. I guess that one? Um, but no, I don't, I don't really know any indie games that, that play in the same space as Pokemon, um, in that way. Sorry, uh, can't, can't really, um, can't really help you there. If you're just looking for, like, a general indie game recommendation, I, I, you know, a hundred million things I could show you if I could just get Steam to pop up with my library so I can find, um, depending on what you're into, like, the Mortuary Assistant is a great little horror game. If you wanted something like Sonic the Hedgehog, like the really good 3D Sonic games, uh, Spark the Electric Jester 3 is fantastic. 20 Minutes Till Dawn, if you want like uh, Vampire Survivors-esque roguelike, or roguelite, I should say. Uh, then there's Citizen Sleeper, which is one of the best sort of narrative indie games that have been published in a long time. I haven't played much of it, but what I have played is fantastic. Paradise March. Marsh is a good little sort of casual, cozy indie game. Uh, Gloomwood, if you want, like, a, a sort of immersive sim sort of game. Uh, Dwarf Fortress, if you're into really fucking hardcore simulation strategy. And Gunlocked, if you want, like, a strolling shoot 'em up kind of game. I'd say that's, that's worth giving a shot. Let's see. What was or were your childhood dream jobs? I wanted to be an animator very badly. Very, very badly, I wanted to be an animator. I worked towards that for a long time and eventually learned enough about the industry to realize that I wouldn't thrive in that kind of workspace, in that kind of workflow. Like, I, I, I still adore the craft of animation. Um, I still sometimes animate a little bit for myself for fun, um, but I would not want to work as an animator at a studio, and I wouldn't want to work as an animator trying to make 
content independently. Because the... It's not, like, it's not the only way to do it isn't to do porn, but it might be one of the only reliable ways to do it is to do porn. Um, which is not really where my interest with animation lies. Let's see. Dima Segue, if you had every skill imaginable through which medium would you express your... I wouldn't. If I had every skill imaginable, I would get very rich, buy an island, and live in a life of complete hedonism for the rest of my existence. <laughs> Okay, that's that's a bad faith interpretation of your of your question. If I had every skill imaginable, I I would make comics, um, which I already do. Like be, I acquired the skills to make comics because I really love making comics. Um, so, like, ass assuming that I I could make a living doing it, that that's that's what I'd be doing. Um, so I don't. I don't- it, nothing would change. I- I already have the skills to make comics, and if I could make a living doing that, I probably would be. Would you consider the Caitlyn and Vi heartbreak and heartthrobs as queer No. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. No, it's not. Like, the- the complexity is that it's censored in other regions, right? In other regions, um... It is, like, that- that part of the relationship is censored, they're not allowed to explicitly be in love with each other, but, like, it- the skins are explicitly like, no, no, these two characters are in love and they want to kiss each other and hold hands and, and like, have sex probably at some point when it's appropriate. Uh, like, it, it, like, it's not subtext, it's text. It's, it's like, that's not queer baiting. That's, that's just the text of the thing is that they are in love with each other. Um, should Riot do more to solidify the relationship in canon outside or inside Summoner's Rift itself? Inside Summoner's Rift is kind of pointless. Because um, that's not really a storytelling space. They could. Like, I mean, that's what they're doing with this skin that has, like, a recall that very explicitly confirms that they send love notes to each other. Um, but, um, like, their relationship is solidified in canon, in Arcane. Certainly, I don't, it's not canon as such in the main canon League of Legends yet, but that's also in part just because, as we discussed previously, fuck all gets published in the in the general League of Legends canon right now. Um, but it's like, it's not queer baiting. Like, queer baiting is when they pretend like, oh, maybe they're going to be like, well, what if maybe they were gay? And then they turn around and say, no, actually, they were straight the whole time. That's queer baiting. Queer baiting is when you sort of intimate or imply or say that maybe, ah, what if, maybe, to string people along. And then you pull the rug out from under them by saying, no, they were straight the whole time. Like, by explicitly deconfirming it, by refute, like, by explicitly saying, no, this isn't true. Um, that's queer baiting. That's when you bait it but it's not true. They are gay for each other. Like, it is explicit. It has been confirmed in Arcane. It's confirmed in, in, in like, the heartbreak and heartthrob thing. And it's, like, it is... Riot has, like, all but confirmed it in the main universe as well. And everyone who knows anything about the League of Legends universe knows that it's just a matter of time. Like, it might be the next next Pride Month that will be the when they finally put out the story that confirms that Vi and Caitlyn are dating in the main universe as well. It's not a... It's not baiting. Like, if they ever do a thing where they publish, like, actually, Vi is 100% straight and Caitlyn has a husband or whatever, then, absolutely, like, I will burn the offices down. They, that will be queer baiting on a on an absolutely unprecedented scale, but no. It's not, like, queer baiting is a word that gets thrown around a little bit too casually, I think. It's only baiting when they explicitly say, ha ha, not true, fuck you. Like, that's what the bait is. It's not baiting when it's, like, subtextual. It's not baiting when it's, like, when it's... Like, just because the characters don't kiss on screen, that doesn't mean that they're being... that their queer relationships even baited at you, right? Like, that that bothers me a little bit when, like, when like especially younger people, like, use the word in that sort of, like, anytime there isn't an explicit love scene, like, on screen, like, anytime, like, they, they don't kiss, anytime they don't, like, explicitly look each other in the eye and say, I am in love with you in a homosexual way, then it's queer baiting. Like, no, like, subtext exists. That's a part of storytelling is, like, if, if it, ex if it is very heavily implied in the subtext, that's all, that's not queer baiting. Anyway, that went off on a rant that's not related to really the thing you said, because that's what I do here. Um, but no, yeah, like, <laughs> It's not, it's not queer baiting when it's, it's only queer baiting if you get baited. 
Do you prefer cakes or pies? Asks Matrox. DPS tanker support. And any more or less of when Elden Ring will return to the channel. Right. Um, I prefer whatever doesn't have gluten in it because I have a gluten allergy, apparently. Um, so... But outside of that, I, I don't really have a preference between cakes or pies. They're just pastries. Both of them. They're just different kinds of pastries. Again, much like the answers to previous questions, they can be executed well or they can be executed poorly. And that's what determines whether or not I like them. DPS tank or support, I play... In MMOs, I prefer to play tank just because you have to do the least. Yeah, you just make sure everything's hitting you and try to take... Uh, less damage than what will kill you and then you're fine because uh, the healer has to constantly heal you and the DPSs have to constantly dodge around all of the everything and like do as much damage as possible and use their abilities on the right timing and manage their rotations and shit and I just have to stand there and go one two three one two th like my rotation is like basic attack uh, other basic attack then the basic attack that heals you and I don't have to deal with deal the jack shit like so I, I, I play tanks any more guess night I have no guess on it no I have the end. I have the many meanings of Bloodborne in sight, right? Like I, I can see the end of that, and as soon as that's over, I'm gonna move on to Elden Rings. Like, if we're very lucky in March, but don't hold me to that because I can't guarantee it. But I really want to. Leviathan, in the Zoro short, you mentioned that you think uh, Zoro, rather, One Piece's fashion sensibilities are better than Bleach's. Could you elaborate on that thought a bit? Whether it be as to why Oda's drip is better or Kubo's drip is worse, so. I think Kubo has definitely got great drip in the splash pages. Like, yeah, no, like, he, he draws those characters in some really cool early 2000s street fashion and fashion shit in, in, in the splash pages on things. Inside of the actual comic of Bleach itself, they're nothing special. None of them wear anything special. None of them. Like, for the most part, they just wear fucking black and white robes. All the fucking, like, most of the characters just, like... All of the fucking Shinigami, all of the fucking Arankar, all of the fucking, like, the whatevers, like, whatever other half a billion, in fact, all of the fucking Quincy's, it's just white and black and black and white and white and black and black and white, and that's it's over and over again, these stark uses of negative space, and, like, nothing impressive about it. Whereas, in One Piece itself, like, the characters, especially Zoro, consistently wears a whole bunch of different interesting fits like they wear different clothes depending on where they are and what they're doing and like there's some variety to their goddamn fashion that there just isn't in bleach and i i don't care you can come at me in the comments all you want it's true inside the scope of the comic itself is like yeah occasionally they'll be in civilian clothes and they'll usually look good but they won't look special. They're not interesting. Like, Araki has a claim. Like, Araki, like, Jojo's Bizarre, he has a claim to fucking drip god, right? Like, I will not rate Oda's drip above Araki's ever, but inside the scope of the actual comics themselves, yeah, no, for the most part, the fits in Bleach are boring, and the designs in Bleach are really boring. All the villain designs in Bleach are really boring, because it's just the same black and white stark use of negative space bullshit over and over and over again and it just never changed like again I admittedly i never read bleach all the way to the end maybe in the past last part of it maybe it gets better but i so fucking bored by the rn car i'm so fucking bored by the quincy's i'm so fucking bored by kubo's character design by the end of it 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 became derivative of a derivative of a derivative of a derivative of itself, and it never really did anything special with its own premise or anything. So, that, yeah, anyway, I have some negative feelings about... But again, yes, the splash pages, all very nice, good fits and shit. Those don't show up in the comic, so they don't count. There. <laughs> arbitrary rule set by me means I'm right. <laughs> What are some of the most outstanding character designs of human characters in the Pokemon series, in your opinion? Hmm. Uh, I like Lusamine from Sun and Moon, actually. I think she's a very solid villain design. Uh, broadly speaking, the villains are not always great in Pokemon. Um, N has a good character design, I think, for what he is. Uh, most of the teams, though, not really that great. And gym leaders, like, I'm, I'm like, a, a lot of the poke, like, I, Pokemon character design has a very specific vibe. 
that it very rarely steps outside of. And so, like, Larry from uh, from Scarlet Violet is really fun, specifically because he, he like, he, because he's meant to be, like, this salary man. But then they kind of can't help themselves when they give him a hairstyle that's way too interesting. Like, they give his face way too much care. Like, he would have been better if he was boring, more boring, if they hadn't given him those little, those little bits of something more special. Um, they would have been better. Um... I haven't played Violet in a while, so I can't remember. Um, but the 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 uh, home uh, the homeroom like oh, uh, home economics guy, the chef, the person who teach you uh, who teaches the cooking class at the school, he has a great character design because he's so bright and colorful, and that like contrasts really nicely with like his big bulky sort of huge uh, form. I quite like the gym leader in Violet, and I haven't actually fought her yet. The gym leader in Violet, who's like the um, also the history teacher, I think she is. Um, Who's like who has this, this sort of uh, like, like middle aged rap goddess kind of thing going on? That's very cool. I really like that. Uh, Giovanni is pretty good, actually. Like he has, like he really does have the mob mob boss vibe. Like he really does feel kind of dangerous, right? He really does feel like oh, sh like this guy might actually kill you. <laughs> like if he, if he felt like it, he might actually have you murdered. Um, like you get that feeling from him. There's never really any real threat, but you know. Um, but I do kind of get that from him. Um, the ghost tr trainer from Gen Nine or Gen Eight. Uh, the ghost trainer from 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 the last generation, Sword and Shield. What would they call it? like the with the mask and like the long sleeves? That was pretty good. Um, I like um, the um, the painter girl. I can't remember the names of these characters. Um, the painter girl. Who was like who? Her whole thing was like she dappled in paint all over the thing. I, I quite liked her character design. Um, I'd have to look at look them up to really form any strong opinions. I'm just sort of going off like what pings in my memory that I quite liked at the time. Um, but I don't have a strong ranking, as you can tell, um, of ma human Pokemon character designs. That might be an idea for shorts though, to do some shorts about the human character designs, like ranking, like doing reviews of all the gym leaders. Maybe I should do that alongside the Pokemon. Anyway. Hi, Skyn. I know that you aren't a fan of favorite questions, but are there any historical topics you can't get enough of? I have a real fondness for um, for Norse history, like for the history of the Vikings, for the history of of, of like um, like of my home region of Scandinavia. Like, I have a real fondness for that. I have a like a, when I was younger, I was quite obsessed with the history of Japan because of weep reasons, you know, but also because I just think it's fascinating, like the, the that they have this whole period of the country being closed and frozen in time, essentially, in like relative to the rest of the world. Um, I find their their re historical relationship with China and Korea really interesting, like for better and for worse. Um, I really like that. I like their sort of like the, their national conception of, of themselves as existing on the at the end of the world in many ways. Um, that sort of informs like some of the ways they think about their global position culturally over time. Uh, like there's a lot of interesting stuff there, but like like um, like Iron Age Scandinavian history is really fascinating because it's such a un it's such a difficult topic to explore because the Vikings left almost no written sources of their own. Like just uh, we were so reliant on archaeology um, and like sagas that were like in reinterpreted and like very very unreliable as historical sources. Um, it's a really fascinating part of history, I think. I need to blow my nose again. I am so nasally. It annoys me. And sorry about these noises and stuff. I don't I don't really edit these, so I, I can't cut them out for you. Um, Hi, Sky. How are you doing? Says Yorosa Yoran. Uh, remember you really dislike Shivana's dragon form. Could you give some examples of a dragon design you do like and explain what would be a good direction for a Shivana rework? The thing I dislike about Shivana's dragon form is essentially that it is so spindly and lanky and really kind of unappealing in the way that's put like it's just it just looks kind of ugly and scrawny it doesn't really represent unleashed power um it doesn't really look powerful at all is sort of the big problem that i have with it and so like i think shivana is well served by having a generic dragon form like not not something that's like sort of invents a whole new type of dragon out of whole cloth it's more that i think she needs something that is more expressive of what the dragon form means to her, right? Because Shivana is the story about this character 
who tries to live a human life, right? Like she tries to be a human being. It's a werewolf story in essence. Um, she tries to be a human being. She tries to live a normal human life. She tries to integrate into Masi. She tries to become part of the society and become accepted despite of, like despite the way that she is as a person, that like, she has this raging inferno of power inside her that she can't ne can never let loose and for which she will never be accepted in the society that she lives, right? Um, so like so that the dragon form of Shivana represents on some level shame to her. It's something that she's like that she struggles with, um, theoretically anyway. It represents like a wildness. It represents like a a raw expression of selfhood and of power. Um, like it might ex it might uh, represent to her desire, like her sublimated desires that she's that she's like holding back in order to fit into Demacian society. It should be all of those things. Like, and if you wanted it to focus more on like being an expression of Shivana's repressed desires, like her repressed id, essentially, that's when you'd go. Like, I would make it more humanoid and then sexualize it a little bit, maybe. Like, if if like if you want to go with like the, the idea that she has this desire to be like with Jarvan or to be human, like you can you can express that desire through like a a dragon form that is humanoid and sexualized, right? If you want it to be more about, like, a wild brutality or, an, like, an, 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 an unchanged wildness in the part of her soul, that's when you would go with a more animalistic-looking dragon. That's when you would go with a dragon form that, like, really expresses uncontrollable wild power, right? So, like, maybe something where, like, like, um, where, like, fire is literally leaking out through her scales. Like, maybe, in fact, if you wanted it to be, like, a thing about shame for her, like, this, this is, like, a shameful part of her that she's trying to keep hidden or control, or that, like, she considers, like, a, a, a negative part of her heritage, have her bleeding. Like, have her transform into the dragon, and lava literally bleeds out between her scales as though she's, like, permanently wounded and hurting. And also that becomes a thing of, like, that lava that's leaking out all that heat and all that fire causes damage to the people around her. So it's, like, this thing of, like, oh, shit, you have to keep this under control. Otherwise, you're going to hurt the people you love. Oh, hey, there's a way to express that in, in like, in the dragon form itself. So, like, it depends on what you want to express about Shivana. But the problem with the current dragon form is that, first of all, it's ugly. It's really spindly. It doesn't look powerful. And also, it doesn't relate to what the dragon means to Shivana at all. Like, think of, of like, the classic example, Bruce Banner and the Hulk, right? Like, the Hulk represents Bruce Banner's anger, his rage. Like, he is this, he is in human form, this meek little, sort of, like, weak nerd man, right? Like, who is, who's, like, so emasculated and, and doesn't really feel like he has any power over his life. And, he, like, he's, he's afraid of himself and he struggles to um, retain control. And then the Hulk is the expression of all of those anxieties and all of those fears and all of that anger that he has inside of him, right? Like, the Hulk relates to who Bruce Banner is as a person in a very specific way. That's why the Hulk is designed the way that, that it is. Um, I would want something similar for Shivana. Let's see, Lurper Lurper, why is the song Toxic Love from Fern Gully so horny? Because Tim Curry is singing it. Sandra, provided you have some spare time doing your adventures on FFXIV, would you like to travel to visit viewers' houses? Yes, I would. Um, it's sort of along the lines of, I want to do that fashion show that I've been talking about that I've just never had the time to really set up and pull off. I want to do that. And I also, at some point, like want to do a little thing of like, hey, let's just travel around to some data centers and like and like see people's houses like i haven't never seen player housing i've never been to a player house i don't know what they look like so i, I would love to see some really creatively interestingly decorated ones like themed ones silly ones that would be very cool definitely a thing i'd do at some point um, but for now i just want to i just want to experience the story kind of <laughs> i i really am invested in the story of heaven's ward so far i want to see what it has to offer and sort of that so that's going to be what's taking up my time in the 14 streams Perry15, what's the funniest Pokemon of all time? Snom. Snom. Yeah. Snom. Matrox, have you seen or plan to see Legends of Vox Machina? No, uh, I don't. I've never watched Critical Role, um, so I don't really have any attachment to it. And from what I've seen of clips and stuff that have been posted online, it's like, yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a perfectly reasonably well-animated fantasy action adventure series, but because I don't have any connection to the characters, I don't have any... I don't really have any reason to care, so I don't know why I should prioritize that above anything else that I choose to spend my time on right now. And Matrox again, just curious, have you seen any of Super Eyepatch Wolf's videos? As far as I know, you don't really do React content. Yeah, no, I don't. Um, 
but I highly recommend his video essay, especially his wrestling video trilogy. So I do watch I Patch Wolf. Uh, I watch all of his videos, and uh, I quite like most of them. I um, I Patch Wolf, in terms of the way that he makes his videos, is a subject that I've I, I've I've debated in my mind for months and months now whether to do some videos that sort of where I criticize other YouTubers' video styles, like where I, I like I sort of specifically because I I spend so much of my time criticizing corporate product, right? Like, and for corporate product, you need a particular lens, um, like one that I I think should be harsh and very unforgiving. Like, I don't think a billion dollar corporation gets to get away with shit ever and shouldn't be allowed to get away with shit. Like, the workers, absolutely, but the corporation itself, no, never. Like, you should hold them to the highest possible standard because, like, if you're not at the highest possible standard, how do you justify being a billion dollar fucking corporation? But there are other modes of criticism. There are other ways to criticize media. And, and one of the things I've been thinking about is like, how could I showcase that? How could I make content that's sort of like, outside of just teaching people to yell at corporations, which is always good and always justified, how can I sort of, if, if people watch my videos and sort of learn anything from them, I would like to model, at least, a mode of engaging with criticism of things that aren't corporate. Like, fellow YouTubers who are, like, just people in their fucking bedrooms like me, how do you criticize something like that in a positive, constructive way? Like, even if, if it's something that you... And I have some criticisms of Eyepatch Wolf. Like, I have some foibles and some things I've noticed in his videos, some, some, some things about the way that he writes and delivers his scripts, especially, that I feel like... It would be okay to, like, it's well, it's not mean-spirited or cruel or an attack on his person, but a thing of, like, hey, I've noticed some things about the way that this content is put together, and I think it might be interesting to discuss that, right? Like, in a way that isn't about, like, tearing anything down or, like, like being mean, but in a way that's, like, because I think the ability to criticize media in general, like, no matter who makes it, is important. Like, I, I kind of... I want to model that because it's one of those things of like, the reason why I haven't done it is because being critical of other YouTubers is a fucking minefield. And if the YouTuber in question takes it poorly, uh, that can get you in like actual fucking trouble. Like that, if they have a dedicated enough fan base, that's when you can get doxing. And that's when you can get like people trying to hack into your accounts and like harassment for months on social media and like people spamming the comments under your own videos like oh you f i would fucking criticize him you fucking suck all your videos are shit you piece of like so it's one of those things of like i have like a number of youtubers that i watch a lot and who i really like but where i also have some like uh, overly sarcastic productions i have some criticisms of the way that they produce their content like the way like the aesthetics with which some of their content is presented um that I feel like are perfectly reasonable and innocent and not, like, harmful or, or aggressive or cruel, that I think it would be, might be interesting to create a video about how to do that, like, how to criticize things that are not corporate, how to criticize things in a way that is not, like, destructive or drama farming, but that requires me to take the risk. <laughs> Of like, because they're all YouTubers who are way bigger than me. Um, and like, if if they react negatively, and I don't think they would, like Super Eyepatch Wolf seems like a re very reasonable, fun guy. Um, and same thing with OSP, I don't think they would. But if their fan base decides to react negatively, right? It's mm, it's risky. It, it's, yeah, it's something I've th thought about. But no, the, the question you asked whether I've watched it is, yes, I have watched all of his videos. <laughs> How the fuck did I get into that topic? Uh, Male Jade, if you had to decide on a new form of governance for the four Final Fantasy XIV city-states you've seen yet, what would they be? <laughs> You're trying to bait me. You're trying to bait me. No, you get your Uldar rants on stream like everyone else. Um, but, I, I mean, it... I guess it depends on what you're asking, because, like, I would like them all to have democracy, please representative democracy would be good and get rid of the kings and the like the the structural hierarchy abolish private property um institute communist utopia <laughs> it's, it's like uh, that that would be what i want if you're talking about in terms of like what might be interesting for the storytelling of the regions that's a much more complicated question um 
Because, like, for all that I rant about them, I do think that, like, Uldah being what it is, is interesting. Like, it certainly gives me a lot to talk about, right? Um, same thing with, with Limsa Laminsa. Like, there are some problems with the way that that place is run. There are some problems with the way that Gradania is run. But those are interesting problems, right? Um, so, like, it, I, I would guess I would th have to think of something else that would be interesting for them to be run on. Like, a, a way that it would be interesting for them to, like, that would generate some interesting stories or something. And, like, for that, like, I guess it would be interesting if Ulda actually tried, like, had to struggle with trying to form a republic. Like, if the Sultana actually had been allowed to go through with her abdication and, like, they actually had to try and form a republic, that would be interesting. Limsa Laminsa might be interesting if they ran on, like, a sort of um, confederated system, uh, like, a confederated council of captains. Like, rather than having an admiral who's in charge of the whole thing like a fleet, like, having something like a pirate council, right? Like, where all the various captains sort of represent their own interests and, like... Uh, and authorities and essentially run it like like a like a council of, of chieftains um, in a sense that might be interesting and Gradania would be interesting if it like it like if again it had a division between the spiritual government and the um, and like the material government like the the secular government where like there are secular leaders who are like democratically elected and then you have this clergy of the seed seers who like interpret the will of the elementals and it's like there's this political tension and struggle between them where the people who actually run the material conditions of Gradania's day-to-day -day life are like why can't we farm here like there's arable farmland we have a food crisis why can't we farm there and the seed seers go oh well elementals say no um for because of reasons that we're not going to explain to like that might lead to some interesting in conflicts and shit um but yeah Mira's Bogo's binted no Blingo is banted. Are all drawings art? Yes. Um, yeah, like if, uh, like if I take the approach to whether something or not is art or not is like, do you, do you perceive it as art? In which then in that case it is. Um, if someone perceives it as art, then definitionally it is. And that like, in case anyone's wondering, yeah, that goes for AI art as well. AI art is definitely art. I don't think it's interesting to hackle over that. What's interesting to talk about with AI art is what kind of art it is and what what it does, How it, what are the conditions of its production and what effect is it likely to have on the world, i.e. really bad negative ones and it fucking sucks and fuck it. That it's stupid garbage art, it's dumb art, it's shitty art. But arguing over whether or not it's art, I think is, is silly. Hey, Sky, I was wondering, since it came up a bunch already, where in the theoretical queue of your content, Disco Elysium would be placed? Ah, uh, um, I don't know. Um, it's, I really, 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 really desperately want to play it, but it's also one of those things of like, I need to have the space to do it. I can't half-ass it. I know this. Specifically also because of the type of game that it is. It's a CRPG. Like, if I start playing Disco Elysium and something makes me take, like, a four-week break in the middle of it, I don't think I'll come back to it. Like, I don't think I'll be it because I will need to restart it from the beginning. I will have to. Like, I know this of myself. I cannot take a break in the middle of a game like that. I can't. I will never finish it. Um, so it's one of those things I need the space and time around me to be able to commit to a playthrough of it. Um, it's like if I'm doing it for content, right? Like, because if I was just playing it for myself, uh, I could just do that. I could just restart it over and over again and eventually get on a run that actually takes me to the end. That would be fine. But for content, you kind of can't do that. Um, so, I don't know. It depends. Like, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Have you played the Yuffie DLC from Final Fantasy VII Remake yet? Asks Manja Art. Not yet. I have it. It's loaded on my PC, even. Um where I've been meaning to record it for ages, but are you planning to record it for the Let's Play channel before the next game comes out? Yeah, I should, shouldn't I? Like, I, sh I should probably try and get through that before before part two of the remake comes out. I want to. We'll, we'll see if I have time. 
Bapper, hi Sky, I've been binging a lot of your shorts recently and refound the Can You Gender Swap series that I really enjoyed watching, re-watching after a while. So I thought I'd ask, since I'm also watching the other series for the first time, could you gender swap Naruto Uzumaki without needing to rewrite the story? Also related to the last question, how's your day? Hope it's going well. And I'd say yes, um, with Naruto specifically. Um, yes, you can gender swap him. Like, there there are parts of his story, there are things, that, like, there are beats and moments in his story that's, that change character a lot if he's a girl, right? Like that, like uh, the relationship with Jiraiya, um, the thing he does with sexy sexy no jutsu uh, would read very differently if, if, if he was a girl, um, but he could still do it. Like, um, I don't think most of Naruto's story is gendered. I really don't. Uh, the reason not to do it would be because it would be like, everyone already reads the relationship, but like, well, not everyone, but like, people already read the relationship between Naruto and Sasuke as homoerotic, right? Or at least, like, homo romantic. That, like, that their passion and, like, their deep dedication to each other and, like, their connection has, like, the elements that could be a romance, right? Like, e even if it isn't, like, it has that emotional intensity, right? If Naruto was a girl, I think it, like, it would be very hard for people not to start going, oh, Sakura jealousy, right? Like that his relationship, or her relationship rather, with Sakura would be tinted by all of these things that we associate with fem fem like women as romantic rivals and women as like, it, it, I think it would be tainted by all of that. And that's not really something in the story itself. That's more about like the way that an audience would receive it would change substantially. But I th don't think there's anything in the story of Naruto that precludes gender swapping. Um, even like the romantic subplot, like the, the romance with Hinata, like Hinata, just be a lesbian romance, couldn't it? Like, um, so no, I, d I don't think there's any reason you couldn't gender swap Naruto. Um, but I don't think I would make that short because, well, the reason why I stopped making them is because you don't want to know what the comments were like on those shorts. You don't want to know. You don't want to... Like, no, I... It, it became more trouble than it was worth after a while. Matrox. Oh, hey! Hey! We made it! We made it! We made it! We made it to the end of it, and it only took an hour and a half. Okay. Right. Well. Um. Hopefully be back with one of these next month. <laughs> not, not after, like, three months. Um... And if you want to ask any questions for this, uh, you can do it on the Discord if you are any kind of supporter. Like, if you've donated, like, a one-time thing on coffee, remember to link your Discord to your coffee account. You'd have to need, need an account on coffee. If you're a Patreon supporter, if you're a Twitch subscriber, if you are a YouTube member on any of the channels that have memberships enabled, you can ask questions. If you are, I think, even if you're a Nitro booster on Discord, actually. Probably. Um, have I enabled that? I think I have. Um... You can ask questions, and I'll do one of these where I'll talk through them, and I'll answer them, and hopefully, next time, I won't be so nasally on that. Oh, my God. My sinuses won't be so swollen, and I'll sound a little bit better. I, I, I think I ended up rushing a little bit here because I had so many questions. Um, so sorry about that to, to those of you whose questions I kind of rushed past. Um, yeah, I've kinda had kind of a stressful day, so... I'm not 100%, like, did I come across as aggressive with any of my answers? I hope I didn't, or dismissive, because, like, I don't think I had as much patience today as I usually do, because I, again, I'm in the middle of, I'm doing the Bloodborne project, I have another project that I'm working on that I want to come out in March uh, 15th, around the, like, sometime after March 15th, kind of ish, that I'm really kind of excited about, it's a really cool project, but it's also one that I know won't get very many views. Because that's just the way that it goes. Um, and I'm okay with that, but it's just, it's one of those things that's stressing me out. Because until I have finished that and the and the Many Meanings of Bloodborne thing, I can't, I can't work on videos that, that actually generate revenue. And that, like, anything that's to do with financials and money and shit always stress me the fuck out. Um, and it's been eating a lot of my brain recently, which is part of the reason why I haven't been able to do these podcast things. Anyway, if you want to ask questions, they, uh, you can do that. Um, if you want to give me money. Um, but for those of you who have given me money, <laughs> thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. I hope my question, my answers were somewhat satisfactory. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this long thing of many questions with my nasally voice. 
How do I end videos again? I can't remember. Oh, right. Thank you very much for watching. Remember to be kind to one another. Have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourselves. And may the tides of history wash gently over us all.